Mancini, Matteo uh, did uh, his visa and then he worked. Right? He actually speaks French. Uh, he's a very, very um, able to get around the streets of Paris. <laughs> and so then he moved to MIT in 2013. He's a professor at MIT. And I don't think he needs further introduction. You know, most of you know him. He's going to talk to us about the Bali crisis. All right, well, thank you very much, first of all, Stefan, and uh, thank you all, guys. It's been a great pleasure to be around here for the last three days, and uh, I promise uh, another half a day, and then you'll, uh, you'll get rid of me. Um, also, you know, if there is anyone on YouTube, uh, I hope you will enjoy the talk. And um, I actually like to start my talk uh, from uh, this video, which is, uh, you know, very, uh, my personal opinion, an interesting one. Uh, many times people wonder what this uh, colorful uh, you know, video is. These are, <clears throat> first of all, this is not a simulation, it's an experiment. And what you're looking at is the heat flux that uh, is being released by a solid surface towards the liquid phase during a boiling process. Okay? And something you may recognize is the presence of these uh, very uh, you know, bright uh, red rings with very high heat flux uh, levels, those are the regions where uh, the microlayer is forming. Okay? And one key difference compared to uh, single bubbles uh, that are very nice and uh, round shaped is that uh, in an uh, actual boiling process, a microlayer can have very difficult uh, shapes to predict. And that's because of the uh, flow pres presence of the flow, is because of the Sorry, the presence of other bubbles that affect the hydrodynamic of, uh, of each other, okay? Now, something that you may also notice is that in this particular spot here, of this surface, the heat flux is basically zero, okay? And the reason why it's zero is that that part of the surface is uh, covered by a stable vapor film. And vapor has poorly transfer properties. And if you have the patience to wait, uh, this... Uh, a spot here will uh, essentially spread all over the surface, okay? This is a, a consequence of a boiling instability, or say a thermodynamic instability called boiling crisis. And the talk uh, uh, today is about uh, predicting the condition that uh, triggered this kind of phenomenon. Now, a step back for those that, uh, you know, uh, never met him, on, or uh, uh, you know, are still interested in knowing what I'm doing, uh, my lab, which is the Red Lab, uh, essentially work in three main areas. The most important one is the development of uh, investigation capabilities. We have uh, <clears throat> uh, led the, the development of uh, optical non-intrusive techniques such as infrared thermometry, which gave us the, the video I show you, but also uh, phase detection techniques and other kind of laser techniques to measure temperature within the liquid and so also capture the temperature boundary layer uh, on the surface and around the bubbles. And uh, these, uh, uh, other than the diagnostics, our lab has developed over the years experiments to study boiling phenomena in complex situations such as a high pressure flow boiling of water, which is 150 bar and 320 degrees C, or going all the way down to 80 Kelvin study the boiling of cryogenic fluid. And the reason why we want to do those kind of experiments is that we, we need to answer uh, techno-scientific questions related to the operation of nuclear reactor, related to the uh, propulsion of uh, uh, space rockets, okay, for which, for instance, cryogenic fuels are the, are the current option. Now, if you forget about uh, the applications, uh, the idea is that everything starts from a, a fundamental understanding of physical phenomena. Okay, and that's where uh, our interest for uh, uh, single bubble dynamics, nucleation condition, and uh, thermodynamics come from. And so we call these uh, separate FX studies. We do experiment, but we also like to collaborate with people. Uh, we've been working quite a bit with Yo uh, uh, Sato in PSI, Mirko Magnini from Nottingham, and you know now also with you guys. Hopefully, we will do. Uh, we will help you uh, develop your models. But today's talk is not about these separate effects. Today's talk is about uh, understanding what happens when you put more of these bubbles together and how uh, essentially the interaction of these bubbles, what we call collective effects, uh, triggers the boiling crisis that I was talking about. Okay? <clears throat> now, question 
for the sake of clarity and uh, uh, understanding, are you all familiar with the concepts of boiling crisis? You're not. Excellent. That's what I was hoping to hear. Because I have slides. It would be unfortunate to skip those slides. So here is, the, here is something which I use actually in the, in the uh, thermal hydraulics uh, class. Okay? This is a very uh, quick uh, primer on boiling heat transfer. The idea is that the simplest possible experiment that you can do is to put uh, a wire, electric wire, into a pot of water, and using joule effect, since we are in France, I should say joule, uh, you can circulate current and release a certain amount of heat at the surface, okay? And uh, if the heat that you want to release is large enough, at some point you will observe uh, bubbles nucleating on the surface of that wire. Okay, and when you plot uh, uh, the surface heat flux versus the uh, surface temperature, uh, this corresponds to the so-called onset of nuclear boiling point. Okay, now this is basically the end of uh, natural convection or forced convection, depending on whatever determines the flow conditions. From this point on, uh, uh, as you increase the heat flux, the heat transfer coefficient will increase, and the boiling will become more and more effective, okay? Because increasing the heat flux will result in the activation of more nucleation sites, which are the points on the surface where bubbles are born and, and grow, okay? And so this is a very effective process, because essentially you can think of the heat transfer coefficient as the slope that connects each one of these points to the origin of this plot, okay? So the higher, you know, the heat flux, the higher the heat transfer coefficient. Okay, and this is what we observe in nuclear boiling, where bubbles are fundamentally isolated. They may interact, but their interaction is still fairly mild. And this is a video, I don't know if you can see clearly, but you have bubbles on the surface, and uh, you know, they, the number increase as we uh, increase uh, the heat flux. Actually, I didn't manage to control the animation well, because what I show you is the next step of this process. If you keep increasing the heat flux at some point, the bubbles on the surface will merge all together to form uh, some kind of a continuous vapor layer with poor heat transfer properties and so from a point of fairly you know, stable uh, uh, equilibrium with high transfer coefficient, you will jump immediately to a situation of so-called film boiling. And film there stands for vapor film. Okay? And if this temperature is too high, the wire may actually melt and, and break, okay? And one thing that uh, you may have noticed is that those yellow flames, those are not, this is not a fire, is simply speaking the radiation emitted by the wire that is warming up. So if at some point, actually, you even have a radiation that is in the visible range, okay? Now, this uh, phenomenon of boiling crisis is a uh, limiting factor, or the limiting phenomenon in many applications, the first of which is nuclear reactors. In nuclear reactors, if you have such phenomenon in the nuclear reactor cladding, you will lose one of the barrier uh, that retains the fission product, and so fission product will be released in the primary system. Okay, this is something which we don't want to happen. It's a huge operational issue. And uh, importantly, it's something that limits the economics and the safety of nuclear reactors. Okay, so potentially what we want to do is to be able to avoid this phenomenon and to predict it as accurately as possible so that we can reduce the uncertainty or margin and so-called conservative margin in the operation of reactors. Now, while we have used boiling in you know, uh, un 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 uncountable applications, the problem with the boiling crisis is that fundamentally we still don't know by which kind of instability is triggered. And so if you go to textbook, most likely the explanation you will find is the so-called uh, hydrodynamic instability models that tell you that uh, if you have a high flux, vapor column uh, flowing away from the surface will start to interact due to kelvin helmholtz instability and basically patch together to isolate the surface, okay? So this is a kind of phenomenon that has a characteristic land scale in the order of centimeters, okay? Tens of millimeters, 27 millimeters or so in, a, in atmospheric water. And many of the uh, models uh, still today rely on this kind of uh, far-field description of the process. 
The important part is that uh, there are many other models that come more or less to the same quantitative conclusions that rely on a much uh, you know, more detailed description and uh, suggest that the boiling crisis is, simply speaking, triggered by an instability of the triple contact line. Okay, so we go from uh, essentially a length scale in the order of millimeters to a length scale in the order of a micron or even less. Okay. All right. This is the this is the the premise uh, of the problem. But the idea is that still today, if I you know make a, a, a ask a question to the audience, this is not big enough to get a statistically uh, significant group. But many people will either pick you this option or this option. Okay, and I'm sure. Uh, you can uh, you can uh, verify my uh, hypothesis, okay? What do you think, uh, uh, Alfredo? Where do you lean? To the left or to the right? To the left. Sorry. To the right. Okay. What about you, Stefan? Uh, somewhere in the middle. Somewhere in the middle. Okay. Of course. Okay. <laughs> well, the question is, as demonstrated, it's not it's not clear. Um, now. We, we have started to look into this phenomena uh, about uh, 10 years ago. And the idea was to try to learn as much as we could from uh, the boiling surface and the boiling process. Okay? And that's what uh, motivated uh, us to develop uh, uh, techniques to make those kind of measurements that I showed you before. The idea, guys, is fairly simple. Uh, it's much more complicated to implement, but to understand should be fairly simple. Imagine you have a, a, a surface here. This is a, some kind of a, a glass material. Let's call it sapphire, for instance. The sapphire is uh, uh, optically transparent and is also transparent to infrared radiation. We coat the surface of sapphire with a very thin layer of uh, an electrically conductive material, which is less than a micron thin. So practically speaking, uh, it doesn't have thermal resistance or thermal capacity. And as we circulate current through this sapphire, sorry, through this uh, layer, this layer will generate uh, by Joule effect the heat to boil the water. Okay. And now it's by collecting the infrared radiation emitted by this layer that we can measure temperature and heat flux at this surface. Okay. And the idea is that we can do these kind of measurements on. Uh, a sapphire ITO heater, such as this one, where the surface is visible uh, light transparent as well. But we can also you know, design special surfaces where uh, the uh, surface itself has a commercial type roughness, or has pillars on top, or there are you know, porous coatings that will be used to enhance CHF, for instance. Okay? This is to give you an idea of what we can do in terms of uh, measurements and surface type. <clears throat> Now the question is, how do we use this uh, uh, distribution? How do we use this uh, time-dependent uh, temperature and flux distribution? Well, you know, we can uh, measure the average values to get the boiling curves. Not a big deal. But also, importantly, we can uh, track the position of the surface where bubbles typically uh, nucleate. Okay, count the number. So essentially determine how many of those uh, nucleation sites we have per unit area. And this is called nucleation site density. What are these grayish, uh, small dots? The Those are the nucleation sites that we identify. Um, identify or you design it? No, these are identified. These are identified, we boil, and then once we have boiled, we have algorithms that uh, can go and you know, pick the points where we have bubbles. What are they? They are defects. They are defects. And they are in the range of a micron or say one to eight microns on the surface that we are looking at. Now, I can, I, can, I can give you more details about that later. But the idea is that once you have each one of these defects identified, you can measure their number. But more importantly, you can follow the temperature and heat flux history. And that's basically what give away the characteristic time scale of the boiling process for each one of those nucleation sites. Because by learning how to recognize uh, micro layer evaporation and uh, quenching, you can measure essentially what is the wait time that you have to essentially wait between the departure of a bubble and the nucleation of a new one. We can measure the grow time, which is essentially this time here, which is how long it takes for the bubble to grow. Okay, And if you want, 
you can measure the bubble departure frequency, which is essentially the inverse of this, the sum of two. Okay. They are simultaneous. And you may, you know, people always puzzle by this patch here, which is at hot temperature. If you look here, that's the point where we don't have nucleation sites for some reason. Something that I should say is that this is a cool flow boiling and flow is coming from the bottom. Okay? If you increase the heat flux, that patch will also boil and the temperature will, uh, will homogenize a bit more. So as promised, you can... Uh, measure the bubble departure frequency, wait time. But these are all basically values that are measured by counting each single event for each individual nucleation site, okay? And uh, the beauty when we do this is that uh, we essentially can characterize fundamental time scale of this problem, which are the growth time and uh, as you want the bubble departure frequency, two out of three. Now. There is a limitation in what you can do with infrared thermometry. Infrared thermometry is optimized to study boiling of water at around atmospheric pressure. The reason is that uh, it's very sensitive in the range between three and five microns where you have most of the radiation, okay? And that's a limitation in the cameras. And uh, second is that uh, as of now, this kind of technique don't have the spatial and temporal resolution that you will need to investigate higher pressures. Okay, or much lower temperatures. And so in the past, we came up with an idea to uh, use a light reflection to identify bubbles on the surface. And I want to give you here a few examples. So let me start with this one, which is the easiest to, uh, to visualize. The idea is that when you shine a certain type of light on the surface, the light that is reflected from this uh, visible light transparent surface will depend on whether the surface is in contact with vapor phase or liquid phase. If it's in contact with liquid, the mismatch between the index of refraction of sapphire and the liquid is minimum, so most of the liquid will be transmitted, and the camera doesn't see anything. If it's in contact with vapor, most of the light will be reflected. So on this surface here, on this video, the bright spots correspond to the bubble footprints and the dark gray area corresponds to uh, essentially the liquid nitrogen phase. Here you have the same thing for uh, dielectric fluids. Okay, these dielectric fluids have temperature of, uh, uh, you know, boiling point and ambient pressure in the order of 50 degrees and very low uh, latent heat. This one here is boiling of water at uh, 40 bar. So we're going to very high pressure here. And uh, you can see very similar behavior. And uh, if you apply this technique to uh, boiling of water at low pressure, the major difference that you will notice is the presence of uh, some kind of uh, shaded area with uh, fringes. And maybe this will uh, uh, take uh, just a moment and hoping that there is enough resolution in the, in the cameras. Okay, so when you have those fringes, that, that uh, signature indicate uh, a, a micro layer, okay? And this is always, say, this is typically visible in a low pressure boiling of water. Uh, these kind of fluids here, or water at high pressure, they don't really form micro layer, but what I think happens is the so-called contact line uh, evaporation that you guys are studying, okay? All right, this, is, this was a very quick primer on the experimental techniques that we are using. I don't know if you have any doubt so far. If you do, I think we can stop one minute. Otherwise, I will uh, jump into the, uh, you know, the meat of the talk, okay? Now, we can measure the number of nucleation cells, we can measure the growth time, we can measure the wait time, and we can also measure, using this technique, the size of the bubbles, okay? And that's where, you know, I'm going to start this uh, section of the talk, which is called scale-free nature of the boiling crisis. Now, let me give you an example in this uh, uh, plot here. These are videos of uh, liquid nitrogen boiling, and essentially here you have the associated boiling curves. So you start typically with very few bubbles, which live independently of their own life, and they don't interact with each other. But as you increase the heat flux, you will start to observe larger and larger patches, okay? And the most interesting part, the most interesting, uh, say, results of this uh, analysis is that uh, 
When you plot uh, the probability distribution function of this footprint area, the moment where uh, essentially you will, uh, it's a precursor to the boiling crisis, will follow a power law distribution. So essentially a straight line in this, uh, in this distribution function, okay? So keep this in mind. Now this is liquid nitrogen, but essentially we can make the same exact observation on uh, boiling of water, for instance. So this is an example of uh, uh, flow boiling with uh, uh, water at one bar. Okay, again, we have some kind of a straight line in this uh, critical condition, which is the boiling crisis. Now, the big question is, why is this important? Okay, why is such a, you know, um, observation uh, uh, important for us? Well, the idea is uh, uh, that uh, if you are in subcooled, say, in a kind of subcritical condition, your distribution will follow a sort of a, you know, damped function. That damped function can be exponentially damped, can be a gamma function, but fundamentally, you will have a distribution where you can define a characteristic land scale. Okay, so a normal normal distribution, for instance, has, is defined through a mean and a standard deviation, and your characteristic scale is essentially the mean value. Okay, now when uh, you go from this uh, exponentially done function and start to see bubble interaction, and eventually the distribution become power low, things get more interesting from the mathematical point of view, because mathematically speaking, these kind of power laws don't have a standard deviation. Or I better say that the standard deviation in this power law becomes infinite. Okay, at least for gamma smaller than three. And for gamma smaller than two, actually even the mean value becomes uh, infinite. But what does this tell is that essentially for this kind of uh, you know situation here you can't define a proper characteristic scale. All right? So it means that essentially uh, in this configuration all the scales are equally important. That's the way I, I think I would say I would I would like to express this concept, okay? So Predicting the behavior of individual bubbles is important, but in the end, what we have to be able to do is to predict also the way that these bubbles interact. And the idea for us was as far as say, going as far as saying that predicting these uh, outliers with low probability could be the, essentially the key to predicting the boiling crisis. Okay, so we want to be able to predict this uh, rare but uh, significant events. Okay. Now, uh, this essentially is what I just said. And uh, the next step in this uh, you know, uh, narrative is to try to find uh, a, a description, a physical description to be able to predict these trends. And uh, the idea actually came to me uh, with a student that had never worked on boiling transfer, but, uh, <clears throat> sorry, had work on predicting uh, the formation and uh, propagation of traffic jams in uh, metropolitan cities, okay? And you know, I make this example here because it's, uh, uh, say, uh, personally meaningful, but uh, this kind of phenomena, you can think, uh, you know, you can think of this kind of phenomena in many areas of physical science and even uh, technology. And one of such example is the spreading of uh, uh, viruses. Okay, another example is uh, um, uh, um, network communications, uh, sorry, Wi-Fi communications, for which you need antennas, okay? And so we started to think with, uh, with Lumiao about uh, a, a model that could take inspiration but one such uh, statistical uh, tools uh, to be able to capture this, uh, this dynamic. Now, keep in mind uh, uh, what we have here, right? So experimentally, we can measure the bubble footprint distributions, and we have uh, um, the mean uh, FTG product, which essentially expresses the probability of having a bubble at a nucleation site, nucleating at a certain time, okay? We have the nucleation site density, and we have the, uh, essentially the uh, scale size of the bubble individual, uh, uh, the individual bubble that do not interact. Okay, so essentially we have four scales, two length scales, uh, n double prime and r, and two time scale, f and tg, okay? Three of those are related to a single bubble. The fourth one is uh, uh, 
is uh, n double prime, which is related to the number of bubbles that you have on the surface. So what we did was very, very simple, okay? We said, okay, let's imagine the surface as a, a canvas where we can generate a random number, say, a, a, a certain number of nucleation sites with a random position, okay? And then we use a Monte Carlo process essentially to uh, mimic the distribution of the bubbles. And how does it work? The idea is that you start taking a, you know, a tour around these uh, sites and determine whether each one of these sites has a bubble. For instance, uh, I think the first one that I have in the animation is here, okay? Now, if you pick this site here, how do you determine whether you have a bubble or not? Well, what you have to do is you have to make a random, generation, random number generation. If the number is larger than this value, you now have a bubble. If it is smaller, you have a bubble. And once you have a bubble, how do you determine how big is the bubble? Well, you have to make another random generation starting from the, the distribution of the radius, okay? So for instance, you get this one here. And then you, go, you move to the next, uh, next bubble, okay? And do the same. Then it may happen that one bubble has already a nucleation site. So that one is already covered, okay? And you continue this process over and over again until the point where you have gone through all the sites, okay? And essentially, you have finished one iteration. And then you have to repeat this iteration you know, as much as it takes to get a, a statistical convergence. One thing that you want to uh, track is uh, the size of the largest and the second largest bubble cluster. Okay, so basically, what is the size of uh, um, the patches of vapor on the surface? And well, to keep it simple, you do this, as I said, hundreds and thousands of times. And eventually, you come up with uh, very similar results to what uh, your, our experiments have uh, revealed. Okay, and particularly that in the moment where we trigger a boiling crisis, this distribution essentially has a power law, which is also very similar to the one we measure experimentally. Okay. Now, what is the meaning of this power law then? So. Why did I mention the, the largest and second largest cluster? Well, the idea is that we can also track these two quantities, G and SG, the largest and second largest bubble patch. And in subcritical condition, essentially, these two are, practically speaking, the same, okay? So they stick to the same size. Everything is kind of uh, uniformly distributed. And so this is shown here in this plot, where the diagonal essentially indicates G equal to SG. Now, numerically, we can continue this exercise by increasing the number of nucleation sites. And when we do so, after this point, essentially, what we observe is a, is a very uh, sharp bifurcation of the process. Okay, so starting from the critical point, if you had a nucleation site, everything will uh, diverge into a situation where uh, there is only a big giant cluster over the surface. So, okay, so fundamentally, this uh, condition uh, identifies an instability in the bubble interaction process. Everything is uh, fairly stable up to a critical point where you have a, a sudden transition to a, a giant vapor pa uh, patch, okay? And so, to keep it simple, uh, the conclusion of this is that um, in, the, in our view, the instability is triggered by a, an in, another instability in the bubble interaction process. And this instability somehow occurs for some critical combinations of uh, the three parameters that I use in the Monte Carlo simulation. So FTG, n double prime, and R, okay? At some point, for a certain combination of this value, we will have this criticality. And that's the moment where the boiling crisis is triggered. Now, how do we use this? How do we use this idea? this observation. Well, essentially, what we did is uh, a bunch of simulations and a bunch of experiments. Now, this is where, uh, um, you know, I go back to the experimental part uh, to show you that we did this kind of experiments on a variety of surfaces that potentially have very different uh, uh, boiling curves, okay? so. Even in pool boiling with water, you can have ITO that has a critically flux in the order of one megawatt per square meter, or certain type of nanoparticles that give you 2.2 megawatt per square meter, and so on. Okay, so you see how different are all these curves. These are traditional boiling curves. 
the beauty is that when you do the distribution, when you plot the distributions, practically speaking, no matter what is the uh, heat transfer coefficient or the uh, critical heat flux, they will all have some kind of power law trend. Okay? And so this kind of force does. They're not all the same. The slope depends on the size of the of the of the bubble, but they all have they all have this transition at the same time. So when the boiling crisis, they all have this power law. And so, how do we move from here? Well, the idea was very simple. Okay, we have a criterion essentially that is there is an instability in the bubble process. We can predict this with a stochastic model. Now, what do we do? We run a bunch of simulation. Okay? We run as many simulations as we want to identify all the possible combination of these three parameters that will give us that bifurcation. Okay? This is a, you know, computer time. And uh, you know, these points that I show you here essentially are all the points for which we observe this bifurcation. Okay? So this is a theoretical result. The beauty in this theoretical result is that uh, <clears throat> It's basically a surface in a plane. It's exactly a surface on that three-dimensional space. And I will not give you the formula for now. I'll take it for later. But uh, the next step was essentially to compare this surface with the measured parameters. And so what I show you here is uh, uh, the value of the experimentally measured uh, uh, FTG N double prime and R uh, during a boiling curve. And so what you have uh, here is an example is one surface, chromium in full boiling, and you see different colors. And the, the darker it gets, the higher is the heat flux. And so this is basically the point where we start to boil. And then all the way up, this is the point where we have the boiling crisis. And you can see that this point is fairly, you know, fairly well predicted by the correlation. OK? Now, this is one surface, but you know, we have approximately 11 uh, different type of uh, configurations. But the bottom line is that no matter really what we look for, we almost all the time uh, ended up in the neighborhood of that uh, critical boundary, OK? Plus minus 20%, give it to me, OK? And so last but not least, what is the mathematical uh, formula that you have there? Well, that's super simple. N double prime FTG pi r square equal to 1. And that's a non-dimensional number, fundamentally, OK? Non-dimensional because FTG is basically a ratio of uh, two time scales. And a pi r square uh, n double prime is a ratio between areas. Now, remember that these are average values. And the fact that this is equal to 1 doesn't mean that all the surface is covered by bubbles. In fact, if you look at uh, the value of the coverage, we are always in the range between 45 and 60 percent, and depends on the bubble size. Okay, so on a, on a surface at boiling crisis, you will have this condition, and uh, and that will correspond to a bubble footprint area fraction in the order of 50 percent. Here we have a two-dimensional view of the same process, and essentially you see that all these points here, which are you know isolated in the top fall more or less within the ballpark of the theoretical prediction. OK? Um, now, how do we use this? Well, we can use this in many ways. But one application that we have as we you know, continue to work on uh, making prediction of boiling crisis and uh, critical heat flux is to use uh, a combination of heat flux partitioning models that will allow us to estimate the heat transfer coefficient and essentially will give you the value of the uh, wall temperature given a certain heat input, OK? And depends on, uh, on these parameters, which in turn depend on the surface property and operating condition and so on. But these models essentially don't give you the stopping point of the boiling curve. The stopping point is actually provided by the boiling crisis. So where to stop with this uh, reproduction of uh, um, with this reproduction of the heat flux by the heat flux partitioning is the is the criterion that we use. Okay, so the stopping point in this curve is not given by partition, but is given by the boiling criteria that I gave you. Okay. Now, let me keep it simple because I, I see the time is uh, uh, running out. 
the uh, the fourth bullet in the, you know to add to the previous conclusion is that uh, if you want to predict the boiling crisis and later on if you want to predict the CHF there is a very simple way to do it is just use this uh, non-dimensional number okay where FTG or average FTG R is the average footprint radius of an individual bubble that doesn't interact and n double prime is the number of nucleation sites on the surface obviously the challenge at this point for me is to be able to predict, starting from surface properties and nucleation sites on the surface, how this parameter will evolve as we uh, heat up the surface. And that's a different story. Okay. Now moving on, uh, um, there are other things that we are doing to further test these hypotheses, and what I'm presenting here essentially are uh, current efforts that we have. Uh, uh, with various collaborators around the world. Uh, here is a, a boiling of a dielectric fluid uh, with and without a heat uh, electric field. So the electric field in this case is used to create a, a, a body force that will boost the effect of gravity. The plan is actually to use this in microgravity later on. But in this case, uh, we just use it to uh, confirm our idea. Now, so what you see here is uh, the same heat flux okay without and with the electric field and uh, you know typically without the electric field you will have a boiling crisis we, with the electric field you're still uh, you know in nuclear boiling now if you look at these two videos maybe it's uh, you know too complicated to tell but the reality is that the the distribution of these curves will be fairly different the one in the you know, uh, boiling crisis condition has a power low, the other one has, is still dumped. Okay? So somehow what the electric field does is to break apart the bubble base and keep them in a subcritical condition, to keep them apart, prevent their interaction. Now, obviously, we can keep increasing the heat flux, and at some point, even with the electric field, we will experience a boiling crisis. When, if you do so, the heat, the, the distribution, well, the video will be here, but the distribution will be just on top of the one that we had at the boiling crisis without the electric field. Okay? So we have, we have to add more bubbles to create that kind of instability in the bubble interaction. Okay? But when it happens, it's still going to be, practically speaking, the same process. Um, this is with electric field and, and dielectric fluids. What you have here is an example of high pressure uh, bonding of water. There is something strange here that, you know, obviously uh, we need to understand as we speak. Uh, but one thing that was very interesting, actually, that we discussed yesterday with a few of you is uh, what happens if we decrease the, the height of our water pool all the way down to a characteristic land scale which is much less than the kelvin helmuth instability wavelength, right? So essentially, we are trying to rule out kelvin helmuth instability from the picture. Well, the answer is simple. Not only we have the same boiling curve, we also have, the, practically speaking, the same criticality condition at the boiling crisis, okay? What do I have left? Well, oh, last slide. Uh, these are examples of pillars. These pillars have a, 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 an amazing uh, uh, boiling behavior. You can get to critical efflux of 2.5, 2.3, which is two, point time, two times at least higher than the rough surface or, sm or smooth surface. And you know, despite that special behavior, you know, you'll find again a power law distribution. And this is another example where we were able to control the position of the nucleation site this time. You see, these are arranged in a kind of a triangular lattice, and the boiling crisis is still still have this kind of uh, uh, power law behavior, okay? All right, so I guess this finishes my, um, my talk. Obviously, I want to uh, thank all the sponsors. Uh, this is a picture of my uh, group of students. It's a bit old, I should update it. And you know, other than the sponsor, I'm very grateful to uh, my colleagues, Jacopo and Emilio, and all the collaborators. You know, I just added uh, UPMC. I'm sure we will have the chance to work together. And uh, so with this, I will stop. And I hope you have uh, as much time as you want for, uh, for questions.
thanks for a great talk. I know exactly what we needed to start the discussion. I'm sure you had a question. I have many, so I don't want to abuse the audience with many questions. Start with one. And then... The first is uh, this problem. You've shown us a very nice plot in which you have a bifurcation. Yeah. And then, so uh, this problem has an hysteresis. So if you go back, did you try to do that? Yeah. Because it's a very similar explanation of the, the linear turbulent transition, which, uh, however, can be explained easier if you go in the, in the other way. It's a laminar. Yeah. So, so the, the answer to your question is yes, it does. And, and the answer is as, a, as a, an appendix, come with an appendix. When you do quenching, it's basically the inverse thing. And you also have that criticality. In that case, the continuum phase is the vapor, and, uh, and the discrete phase is the liquid. But we have, so, we have seen that with uh, liquid nitrogen quenching. Uh, it's still you know, far in the horizon, but uh, it's there. Uh, and as I mentioned to you, I believe, yesterday, we have seen similar phenomena in the transition in flow regimes, in uh, basically uh, even in adiabatic channels. So I think that the idea goes beyond the simple, uh, well, goes beyond the application to uh, bubble instability and boiling crisis, but you can apply to, to other two phase flow uh, phenomena. Uh, 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 it's average in time and by number. Uh, so, so It doesn't change much. The reality is that uh, you know you can think that uh, increasing the heat flux may change frequency, grow time, bubble size, and it does. It does. But the reality is that the, the the major effect is in the nucleation site density. If you have a the, the data are all published, you can see that you know bubble radius is fairly stable. Uh, FTG fairly stable. The number of nucleation sites obviously increases. Okay, but potentially you can go all the way. You know, you can go in any direction. Yes, each nucleation site will give you more or less the same size. You can have nucleation site with different sizes, though. And that's related to the surface, uh, uh, you know, properties. And you have more of those, uh, you know, disparity in the surface that are nanosmooth. Because on nanosmooth surface, you have uh, a less uh, homogeneous distribution of the nucleation site uh, uh, size distribution. In presence of electricity, how do the uh, bubble keep themselves apart? Is it due to the accumulation of charges at the different It's, uh, well, you know, I, you're, um, you're asking the wrong person. That's why I'm working with Paolo Di Mark on that problem. But I think what the bubble, what the electric field does, is it changes the curvature of the of the interface, creating some kind of body force that is related to the gradient of the electric field. So, uh, due to the curvature of the bubble itself, you have an intensification of uh, uh, the electric field and the dielectrophoretic force and other things that, to be honest, I don't fully understand. Uh, but the idea is that, yes, it kind of squeezed the bubble at the bottom, okay? Squeeze the bubble at the bottom, and by squeezing the bubble, essentially prevents, prevents the contact. If you, have, if you have an interest in that area, the best person to talk to is Paolo Di Marco in Pisa. For me, the idea of using electric field is to really prove this dynamic, okay? Prove the dynamic. But I have said there that uh, the presence of the electric field, the charges get accumulated. No, it, it's it's not really uh, it's not related to the free charge in the in the in the system. I think. So this is a flow of water boiling problem. It's also pool. Okay, sorry. No, Your question. Thank you. This is a flow boiling problem, but you never there is no influence of the of the flow field of the velocity. One would expect that. So it, it's, I think there is, a, an, a, there is a, an influence. But we don't see any influence of the flow, like the shear, on the shape of the bubbles. We cannot understand in which direction. I think from your point. Well, can we? I think we can. Let me go back. This is in pool boiling, so bubbles essentially are not moving much. Yeah, yeah I can get. Uh, the very first one. 
first movie. Yeah. I can I can go back and show you. All right, here you are. So these bubbles are going up. You see that the, the yes. micro is typically deformed. Now the question is, do they slide or lift off the surface? In this case, you don't really have lift off. Okay, so the footprint of the bubble, the, the, the footprint that the bubble reach at the moment of maximum expansion is pretty much is pretty much uh, the same uh, uh, as the bubble when the bubble leaves. So the, the bubble doesn't slide. Now you may have sliding in high pressure flow boiling of water. Okay? In those cases, the surface tension is much, much smaller. Okay? And uh, there's nothing basically that keeps the bubble uh, at the position where it nucleates. So in that case, in that case, you see, you can track, uh, you can see a little bit of sliding of bubbles. Okay? Now, how significant is that? It's an open question. Okay, because it's not that you see a bubble moving all the way through the life of this. Okay, but this tells you really whether the bubble is attached or not to the surface. This brings me to a second question. This is a three-dimensional problem, not a two-dimensional problem. Hmm. Because especially you have heat at the floor, you have a heat convection also in the wall parallel direction, but not at the wall. But so you have different cooling properties of fluid on the bubble. So the bubble can evaporate not only in different yeah. areas of its surface. So, uh, but apparently you don't need this. You don't need this effect. It's, it's somehow it's embedded in the footprint radius, right? So I understand perfectly that the bubble will receive vapor and recondense on top, yeah. but, but that effect that you're mentioning is, is captured in the footprint radius and the grow time. Yeah, so that can be influenced by the flow rate, exactly. Which yeah. So the problem now is, as I mentioned, is are we able to predict those parameters correctly? So that that will depend on the flow condition. It will depend on the subcooling. It will depend on the fluid. It will depend on the everything. But the question is, if you are able to predict those things, then you have a, you have you have the instability. Then you have the instability. The, the connection between the surface, the flow, and those parameters is the problem at this point. And I can go even further. The most difficult uh, challenge, the biggest gap to close, is the prediction of the heat transfer coefficient in the liquid phase at the wall. There's not much the microlayer. The microlayer takes 20-30%, uh, but the liquid phase takes 70%, and the heat transfer coefficient on the liquid phase has nothing to do with the value you can measure in force of convection. Okay? It's, it's driven by a mix of uh, transient conduction and transient turbulent conduction and whatever um, you know phenomena so is going to be there. Fluid agitation created by the detaching bubbles that enhances the natural convection. It, it is, but rather than natural convection, what we see in our measurement is our square root of time signatures, which makes me think of diffusion, obviously, and that can be either just simply molecular diffusion or turbulent diffusion in this process. So one question that I have is, how much turbulence is created by these bubbles? And uh, another one, how can you compare the growth rate of the bubbles, so the speed at which the bubble grows, with uh, the flow velocity uh, perpendicular to this growth? So are these two velocities somehow? The, the growth rate is much faster. Typically, bubble grow much faster, and then this the bubble grow faster as a well. But then, let's say the tip of the bubble grow at a certain velocity, so it's you start to see the effect of the flow when the bubble is big enough. When the bubble is big enough, that's what I mean, right? So you have you got you know you I can't say you have a separation of scales because I don't think it's accurate, but somehow the growth the growth time of the bubble is much faster than uh, the characteristic scale that you can get like uh, with uh, radius divided by the velocity. So the growth is tendentially faster than the, uh, you know, the, the drag, let me call it drag, is except, except perhaps if you are in a very high pressure condition, because in that case, uh, in that case, uh, we have seen uh, in, other, in other work that bubble essentially start to 
uh, start to slide away as soon as it's it's born. Okay, so there's no there's no uh, uh, real you know pinning to this or attachment to the nucleation side. You you see it grow and slide away at the same time. And um, double prime F by R squared, or yep. yes. So uh, in this correlation, uh, uh, what are F and TG? So F is the frequency. So it's F TG is TG over. Tg plus Tw. So this thing essentially expressed the fact that if you have a nucleation site, the probability of finding a bubble growing on this nucleation site is equal to to this. Okay. So uh, okay, but this is I mean, this is a function of other hydrodynamic properties, right? Yeah. It's a function of the, yeah. Um, all the thermo thermodynamic and fluid properties. Sure. Of bubble growth. Exactly. So, but again, you have, even if you have R, you have R and TG, well, you can think that they are correlated, but the reality is that this correlation will also depend on the surface. So they are all more or less independent. The, the, the four variables I brought in were more or less independent. They depend on the, they depend on the driving force, which is uh, a cutable prime, and they depend on the operating condition. So this is essentially like the percolation probability on a lattice percolation. You can see it that way. The beauty is that you reconnect this with quantities through which you can uh, make a, a, an energy estimate of the process. So the idea is that you don't need, uh, you need this, and eventually you can use this to set the limit to the, essentially the boiling process, starting from the partitioning or other models that will use the same parameters, essentially. And so was I essentially right when I say it was between the two, between the Kelvin Helmholtz model and the Essence model, or is it you don't agree? Uh, I think it's closer to none of them, mm -hmm. because the important point, Stefan, is that the key message is that with one bubble, you can't predict the boiling crisis. Okay, so it's not about one single bubble. It's about the mechanism of interaction of these bubbles. So for me, it's a near wall for a process, but it's not about uh, equilibrium at the contact line. Okay, it's about the equilibrium at the contact line when you have a very shallow pool of water and the bubble will just grow bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, because that's essentially a, a deterministic problem. In this case, there is a, there's some kind of a, a, you know collective stochastic need, um, phenomenon to to capture. And at some point, you show uh, this uh, parallel for the, um, the, the, the bubbles. Uh, uh, is, does it correspond to the percolation exponents? The percolation exponents are known from percolation. Yeah. So they are very close. Um, they are also, there is also the critical coefficient uh, that I gave, C1, basically. That's this one here. So you can have very similar coefficient if you, if you do the, you know, the Swiss cheese model or the disk model, you get to values of 1.10, 1.12 if you use that model. What I have to say is that this coefficient is slightly surface dependent. Okay, what I mean is that. The coefficient, but then you have the exponent. If you go back a few slides, then we need to hear what I mean. Back. This one. This one? Yes, maybe this one, yes. Maybe yeah. the slope of this, yes. Yeah. Is in the order. Is in 1.6, 1.7. Okay. So it's it's uh, it again. If it is smaller circles, it's slightly it's slightly stiffer. And you, you could do a Monte Carlo, uh, very simple calculation. You just randomly generate it's this long. And the code is this long. Yeah. yeah. And you, you did it. So it works. Yeah, we we well the students and I, but yeah. It's, it's so if you change the contact angle, you're yeah. just changing the velocity at which cluster form, and therefore you're just changing the slope of the power law? If you change the contact angle, you change the bubble size, presumably, at the footprint. Uh, you change also the grow time. 
okay, you change also the frequency, you change also the double prime. So it's a chicken egg problem. But the bottom line is, is not really about the contact angle, it's about the bubble footprint size. And, uh, and yes, if you have a smaller bubble footprint size, you have a, a stiffer power law, but no matter, but no matter, the criterion is still the same. Yes, so you will change just. You will change that. Uh, and uh, to get back to your point, and right, what tri it's not about much the contact angle, because you can have smaller bubbles, even if you have an hydrophobic surface, we have large cavities that nucleate at lower temperature. We have a lower Jacob number. They grow slow and depart, depart easily because there's, a, there's no the inertia forces that keep them attached. So it's really a multidimensional problem. Uh, we have also tried uh, super hydrophobic surfaces, uh, which I don't have here. Uh, in pool bonding, those super hydrophobic surfaces tend to uh, create a, a diverging bubble. Okay, so you have a bubble that grows and then spreads all the way. And that's not something that you know, is described by this approach. But in flow boiling, for instance, where you have a drag and lift to uh, essentially move the bubble away from the surface, you're, you're quite, it's, quite, uh, um, it's in a good agreement, I would say, with this logic. But again, the process is a nuclear boiling. It starts from a nuclear boiling process. So it starts from a, a stable non-equilibrium process. Okay? Then you have situations where that stability is broken, like in, uh, in absence of gravity, for instance, when you have uh, uh, the shallow pool of water. If we for very, very hydrophobic surfaces, uh, things can, can uh, essentially go apart from the definition of nuclear boiling as a collective process. So Do you have one last question? Or, uh... That was one. It was oh, OK. That, uh, you introduced that, but you anticipated that. Uh... OK. Maybe we can ask further questions until we have a coffee break. Ask further questions. Thank you. And then, if you want to stay.